give you a bit of context um, about behavioral insights in Italy. So until last year in Italy, there was unfortunately uh, not a single example of behavioral insights um, applied to, to government. There were sp sporadic standalone initiatives uh, consisting in you know, one project, but there wasn't any institutionalized unit. Um, and you know, coming from an international background, uh, being, living and working abroad for the last uh, few years, I was both, you know, astonished at and surprised by the, the absence of discourse on, on behavioral economics and behavioral insights applied to the public sector. And I, I wanted to, to, I wanted that to change. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity, you know, in my uh, previous uh, work projects, you know, to um, interact with several government officials and Eventually, the, the Secretary of the Environment um, requested, uh, you know, and, and to, um, to help her basically uh, design the, the behavioral economics agenda for the um, plan on behavioral, on environmental policy. And upon my appointment, I was the only advisor to uh, a member of cabinet, uh, specifically devoted to behavioral economics. And just, you know, to give you, um, a bit of contrast, you know, I remember being on a phone call with uh, Chiara Varazzani, who's now the lead behavioral scientist at the OECD. And she was telling me that in Australia, you know, only the prime minister's office had about 30 people, right? And Italy had about the, uh, in Italy, had twice the population and the GDP of Australia. Um, so that, that, that was the state, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, the rest of the world, um, bigger and smaller countries alike were, um, institution uh, instituting uh, full-fledged behavioral insights uh, units. Um, and what actually made things worse is that in Italy there were some attempts to launch some units and they had failed. So the, um, you know, the ground was not fertile at all and um, the, um, the so, you know, the, the, the reason why I wanted to tell you this is because I know that many of the participants here are trying to set up units themselves. Uh, so, you know, don't get frustrated because, you know, if, it's, if it doesn't work out at the beginning, you know, I didn't think it could uh, be any worse than, than it was in Italy uh, until a couple of, um, of years ago. Um, then in, in August 2018, I received a call from the chief of staff of the mayor of Rome who had heard about my job, uh, my, my previous job. Um, and some things that uh, some project had been working on and he and basically the mayor requested a meeting and so here you know the the, the story of our square um, the first behavioral insights unit of Italy begins now the um, yeah that, that's that's exciting right you know the Italy finally has a behavioral insights unit uh, and that's right, except that uh, the unit was, you know, in fact, just, you know, a unit, uh, one person, and there was no staff, there was no budget, uh, but yet, you know, had the ambition of, um, you know, to, to make a positive impact uh, in a very innovative way, um, at least for, for Italy. Uh, but I, you know, I thought to myself, okay, how do I do it? And uh, the answer was, um, public and research partnerships. So what I did uh, was um, I created a registry um, fairly early on and um, anyone could basically sign up to this registry in a very uh, non-bureaucratic way, um, provided that you know, they met specific technical requirements. And these requirements were um, mostly focused on the the technical and knowledge and skills of, of the applicants with, uh, with regards to behavioral science. Um, and, you know, that allowed us to actually, um, you know, despite the fact that, you know, that we didn't have any budget, that there was and, and any staff actually, uh, that was um, actually our, our strength. Because, you know, this, this registry, you know, I managed to promote it. And we, uh, what we did basically is we repurposed um, Rome's policies into RCTs. Um, many were actually, you know, excited to have a three million people lab, 
Um, and so, you know, we were able to recruit, uh, to enlist uh, uh, behavioral scientists from all over the world, from um, Harvard, MIT, you know, many, many people in Boston and the United States, you know, all the way to Australia. And this actually turned, you know, worked out fairly, you know, it worked out nicely because uh, we were actually able to focus uh, on specific verticals, depending on the expertise of our external partner. Um, and so, you know, we were, we, you know, we're working with geneticists from Harvard, as well as uh, people who focus on, on, on transportation behavior in Australia, right? And, and, you know, with this format, we were able to, to specialize in a way. And we, uh, you know, in the first year and a half, we've actually been able to produce, to conduct um, about 40 projects uh, in a variety of policy areas, including public transportation, um, democratic processes, education, tax compliance, um, legal uh, services, and so on. And all of this uh, was done without having actually any behavioral scientist uh, on a payroll, which is not ideal. I don't recommend that anyway, but at least you know, it helps you survive in the startup phase of, uh, of, 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 the, of the unit. Um, these, these projects actually included you know, the first RCT ever uh, conducted in the history, in the millennial history of Rome, as well as uh, the largest trial, to my knowledge, ever conducted in any field in Italy. Um, and this was a trial in, done in collaboration with um, with the uh, Duke's uh, professor Hammond Kacker and uh, HBS's professor um, Jan Yahimovic. Now, the I know that the specific interventions are beyond the scope of the of, of this presentation, uh, but uh, so I won't discuss any of them in detail. Uh, but I wanted to you know just to give you the you know, I want to get you the, the flavor of uh, some of the things that we've been working on. And um, especially, you know, to to um, show you know what was basically my agenda, at least in setting up this unit. And you know, I invite you know whoever is currently thinking or planning on um, setting up a unit. You know, what, what is your actual agenda? Because you know, surely you know we've done projects on tax compliance that have saved. You know, that have, you know we helped collect millions of euros. We've done other projects you know, that helped save millions of euros and you know, or nudge people to uh, take public transportation more and cars uh, less often. And you know, all these I think are loadable goals. And it's very important that the projects actually um, achieve uh, concrete results uh, very early on. Uh, but my personal goal was actually different and it was you know, to change um, mindset to show the Italian public sector that things could be done in a different way and using a different method. So my my goal actually has been to uh, let you know the the environment in which I am um, experience different things, different uh, techniques, different methods, and you know from different disciplines and and learn from those. Um, so this is. An example of the, this is actually the first RCT ever running in Rome, uh, which I mentioned earlier. I haven't translated it on purpose because I don't want you to read it. Because uh, this is a letter that was sent to people that had litigation with, um, they were in litigation with the municipality of Rome. And it was a nudge to prompt them to settle the litigation. Uh, the reason why I haven't translated it is because I want you to focus on what is unusual here. Um, you immediately can recognize that this is a totally different form of communication from any sort of standard um, bureaucratic uh, legalese. And, and this was indeed the goal. Um, and the goal was dual, actually. So there is, of course, you know, evidence, uh, you know, that backs, you know, every single element in this letter. And, you know, we, we do base uh, whatever we do on science. Um, but there is actually something else and which is that you know as a first project i really wanted to show people that this methodology not only works because of the result it achieves uh, but i wanted also to 
see you know, the unpredictability of the result. So most people in civil service, at least in Rome, uh, doubted that uh, you know, sending a letter uh, to people you know, to nudge them to settle litigation would have any effect. Um, even more so, you know, when this was the content of a letter, you know, an image and informal tone and so on. Well, in the end, actually, the intervention was very successful. You know, it more than doubled uh, the settlement rate uh, for the treatment group versus the control group. Um, and it was statistically significant. And, you know, it resulted in um, about 7 million euros in, in, in settlements that were closed, as well as um, several thousand um, working days uh, that the legal department you know, didn't have to uh, spend on these practices. So it was very successful and people were extremely surprised, not because it worked, but because of what worked. Um, and so this is something that I encourage everybody who's you know, designing the first nudges in an organization to think about. Now we've also used uh, another, this, is, this was an idea of Professor Jan Yahimovic from the Harvard Business School. Um, you know, we, we wrote uh, an individualized note on each letter, right? This was also something completely, you know, that was thought to be obstreperous, completely ridiculous at the beginning. Um, and, you know, probably, you know, it's one of the reasons why this intervention did work in the end. Now we've, of course, you know, as I said, uh, run several other nudges um, like this one, um, a variation, you know, different variations and, you know, using different setups. And we've also conducted lab experiments and online experiments. Um, and, but we've also, you know, tried to, you know, use different technologies, different instruments. Um, for instance, you know, recently we've uh, conducted an experiment to evaluate the communication campaign on fare evasion of our public transit company. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Fabio Babiloni and Anastromia. And what we did here, you know, we used uh, several um, biological and neurophysiological metrics. So for instance, we used the uh, galvanic skin response, uh, we used the eye tracking, and we used the uh, EEG to evaluate the effectiveness of, of a campaign. Another example was um, you know, during COVID uh, or after COVID, uh, we used, we implemented a protocol uh, wherein participants who are exposed to an increased amount of stress and anxiety uh, because of COVID um, are actually trained to deal with these negative states, negative emotions um, through the use of VR. Um, this was we were the first municipality uh, or first government actually in the world to use VR specifically to um, aid COVID-19 related stress and anxiety. And um, our protocol was based on a protocol that was uh, piloted in Italy's first COVID-19 hospital in, in the north in the red zone. <clears throat> Another example you know, of uh, something a little different than you sort of, you know, your, your typical nudge intervention is, you know, we're currently working with uh, local um, academics as well as um, scholars from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health um, to use basically biomarkers uh, to evaluate policies. And here, what, you're see, what you see here is, it, is um, a telomere, uh, which is the, you know, which are the little yellow uh, tips at the end of chromosomes. And what basically, uh, what telomeres are, you know, is basically their telomer, their, uh, sorry, biomarkers for longevity. Uh, so basically, you know, what they do is they tell you a lot about the person whose telomere you're measuring. Uh, first of all, you know, they tell you, you know, about their, uh, their longevity, but actually telomeres are associated with a number of, uh, um, of diseases and, and other physiological states. So what, uh, what we're doing here is actually to, to use telomeres to evaluate how certain policies have an effect on the health of people um, in, and you know, using this sort of indirect um, measurement, right? When, when you can't run uh, an RCT. Although you can use, of course, biomarkers also in RCTs. 
specifically, you know, we've been uh, focusing on the role of greenness. Uh, so what is the effect of greenness on, um, on, on, on citizens' health? And in order to do this, what we plan on doing is use satellite data. And so we will basically create um, an index for each geographic indicator in Rome uh, and maybe beyond Rome, actually, we'll be thinking of expanding the project uh, um, to different areas. And through satellite data, we basically um, create this index of, you know, of greenness. So basically, we are able to tell how much, uh, how many green spaces and are in, in, in a specific area, and then see whether you know, there is any um, correlation with, with, um, with biomarkers, with telomeres specifically. And, and you know, the idea is then you know, to investigate you know, what, what, what the effect could be, you know, maybe social cohesion or what behaviors could happen around green areas that, that maybe uh, allow people to, to live longer. So if you have, if you, if you have a longer telomer, um, basically you have, um, on average, you know, you will be, you're more prone to uh, have a longer, a longer life. Now, so over the last year and a half, we were able, you know, to go from one unit, you know, me being, you know, and going, you know, knocking on doors, you know, and uh, nudging people to nudge, um, to actually, you know, being a full-fledged uh, department uh, within the mayor's cabinet office. Uh, you can see on the right, you know, our little uh, headquarters, and. This is again great, except that we, you know, uh, COVID happened. Uh, so we had planned, you know, to 25 interventions uh, across 19 different policy areas. And of course, you know, everything changed due to COVID. Um, this was an interesting period for us, though, because we were, you know, Italy's uh, and um, only behavioral insights unit. And so when COVID-19 happened, we realized, you know, like many other behavioral scientists that the outcome of the pandemic would depend not only on virological issues, but um, on behavioral aspects too. And so, you know, as you know, the only behavioral insights unit in Italy, we felt compelled to actually do something since, you know, there, there isn't this sensitivity at a national level. Um, so what, what we did in the first 24 hours of the emergency, and, you know, that's what, that's exactly, you know, when Italy entered the lockdown, uh, which, you know, uh, we all know what it is now, you know, but by then you know, it, was, it was shocking, uh, you know, the most restrictive measure on a Western country since World War II, and the rest of the world was actually just carrying on as, uh, you know, doing you know things as as usual. Um, what we did in you know in the first 24 hours was actually to uh, we put together a group of behavioral scientists across nine different time zones, and we were able to actually produce the first quantitative empirical data about behavior and the lockdown. To my knowledge, that uh, that was the first experiment. Uh, it was an online experiment, and that was the first. Uh, such experiment in the world on on the lockdown. Um, from then, you know, we went on to um, investigate other other issues, and particularly, you know, in March, you know, we uh, we ran other um, experimental surveys, and what we found was that the emergency was actually shifting very quickly uh, from you know being a medical physical health emergency to being a mental health emergency too. Now, of course, you know, in hindsight, we, we, we all know that, uh, but this was again, you know, in, in March and many countries hadn't even entered the lockdown yet. Um, so this was very interesting. Um, our, the whole process actually was, was, you know, was, was touching in a way because it was really moving to see, you know, how people from all over the world had mobilized, you know, to, to help, um, Italy at the beginning, and then, you know, many of us went on to do uh, different things, you know, in different projects. Um, you know, this actually, this, you can see the group, you know, of people that are too numerous to, 
to thank all of them individually. Um, you know, the, the story was actually featured on uh, Scientific American and local um, press here in Italy, and our work has then been um, featured and used, you know, by the, the OECD and the UNDP. So what uh, comes next? So um, there are mostly two things that um, we're trying to do now. And one is uh, internal, and that's uh, basically to dissolve the unit. So you may think, okay, well, that's a paradox. Why would you want to do that? Uh, well, the, the idea is to actually dissolve the unit to embed it operationally across the, um, the municipality. So, of course, you know, the municipality of Rome is a behemoth. We have about uh, 24,000 civil servants. We have about 20 city-owned companies, which in turn employ another uh, 26,000 employees. Um, one of our city-owned company has a subsidiary in Peru and another one in the Dominican Republic, right? So just to give you an idea of the complexity uh, that uh, all comes, you know, from, from this ecosystem. Um, so, of course, you know, building behavioral insights operationally is very, uh, is very hard uh, in, um, in, such a, in such a complex and uh, convoluted environment. So what we're doing is actually building small behavioral insights units within the municipality um, and its companies. Um, you know, we've been lucky enough to have many successes early on. And um, these this successes I in, um, have actually not come from where the policy priorities uh, were. So my, um, you know, something else that, you know, I encourage people to think is, you know, not to listen to uh, actually, you know, what, you know, what, to what, you know, the, the policy priorities are all the time. When, when I came here, you know, I was told, oh, well, you know, tax compliance actually isn't that important. Um, little secret of Rome, you know, yes, uh, Rome has many financial projects, but actually tax compliance is not a priority because of you know, a number of, of reasons. You know, it's difficult to spend the money because of bureaucracy and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, I knew that tax compliance was probably going to be one of the low hanging fruits. So what uh, I did, you know, I insisted in, uh, you know, in working in, in this policy area. And one of the first RCTs was on the on real estate tax here in Rome. And it was very successful and tax compliance has now become the main, uh, one of the main um, policy areas in which we work. Um, the other one probably being transportation. Um, so the, you know, the reason why I insisted is was not, you know, because I wanted uh, necessarily to work on tax compliance to help that policy area, but uh, most specifically, the goal was to um, have some quick wins and encourage people, you know, to, uh, and, and once you do have some quick wins using this innovative approach, you know, that you know, nobody had ever used at the municipality of Rome, um, you, you know, you see that opinions and attitudes change dramatically. And so policy, uh, priorities also change and all of a sudden, you know, every single euro has to be saved through behavioral insights. Now, of course, you know, you do have to listen to people, but uh, for other reasons. So my, another mistake that I've seen a lot in, in some of our projects is that the, the technical expert uh, does not necessarily listen to the people that are involved in the processes. And this I think is, is a huge mistake uh, because yes, we know a lot about human behavior. You know, there has been a lot of research and there is a lot of literature on that, uh, but actually what is often missing is the context. Um, and there have been numerous issues, you know, on external uh, validity of uh, nudges and behavioral interventions. Um, and one way we've been able to, um, circumvent that issue is to really listen to the people uh, that own the processes 
and make them part of the co-design of the interventions. Another aspect that uh, I wish you know I had done more. Honestly, I think this was uh, a mistake early on, but probably I didn't have the, the bandwidth, you know, being alone at, at the start. You know, but I think it's very important to do capacity building within organizations. So um, when as soon as you know we we did have some more bandwidth and resources, you know, we immediately started organizing lectures and workshops. And this is where I think you know the change really happens. Um, it's when you sh when you know people come to you with ideas um, or you know thing nudges that can be um, that can be used um, and policy areas you know that uh, can benefit from these approaches. Um, it's it's not something that you necessarily see very f from the start, but it definitely does pay off. Um, so my recommendation is to you know invest in capacity building a lot within organizations. Um, the, the sooner you do that, uh, the better it is. Um, and it also allows you um, to avoid backlashes. Uh, so we have had instances within the municipality wherein, um, you know, some, you know, individuals uh, were not happy with, uh, with these approaches and not because they didn't work, but you know, perhaps you know, some felt like you know we were teaching them what to do uh, or how to do things better. Uh, some felt like you know, with their their shortcomings were being put under the spotlight. Um, if you if you actually encourage people to use this approach themselves, it actually makes it much easier to and gender collaboration uh, that, that becomes um, efficient in, in the long run. So uh, another thing that we are trying to do is to build an ecosystem in Rome and beyond uh, for behavioral insights. Um, so my plan here is to actually um, bring in more and more often the local universities and we're currently you know, partnering with uh, local universities such as Sapienza, as well as the University of Chicago, the Booth Business School, uh, in, in the same projects. Um, so the idea is to build uh, an ecosystem for behavioral insights where research can benefit from the application of behavioral insights in the field. And at the same time, uh, uh, these new advances can be incorporated in policy making to benefit the community. Um, the very ambitious project we are working on is the creation of a data platform, which will encompass a variety of sources um, of, uh, of data, um, including administrative data, behavioral data, uh, but also um, biological data, psychometric data. And here the idea is that um, we, what we want to achieve in the medium to long run is a, a system for policy making wherein um, citizens who opt in into this system um, can actually receive policies that are meaningful to the to the individual. I think that um, and one of the things that we've seen here in Rome is that no matter what uh, the intervention you run, and no matter you know how nice and sweet you are, you will always find uh, someone who gets offended or who doesn't like you know heterogeneous to even effects are everywhere, and. Um, what we, we're striving um, to do is to go beyond average treatment effects and progressively design policies that have the individual at the center. I, of course, this is easier said than done, and there are many issues, you know, from methods to uh, feasibility, uh, but that's the exciting part, if you ask me, and uh, we are trying to be at the, at the frontier of this. Um, with regards to sharing uh, knowledge, you know, we are, as I said, building uh, smaller units. Uh, Jackie mentioned Attac X. Uh, we, um, Attac is our city owned public transportation company, and they have built their own behavioral uh, insights group within, within the company. And together, you know, we're working on, on a number of issues from absenteeism 
to um, fair evasion to masking and, uh, and many other and many other aspects so jk i think i'm a little early but uh, i guess we have more time for q a yes thank you so much Federico, um, so we'll continue on with the conversation uh, with you, Jackie, and I have some questions and hopefully um, our audience can also jump in, uh, drop your questions in the Q&A box or the chat. Um, so one thing that comes to mind as I was listening to you um, was the question around partnerships um, and how important they were. And can you tell us a little bit more as you know, you went on from like knocking on doors to like forming an actual team, what role the partnerships played and how were you able to bring those partnerships into your um, nudge unit? Could you elaborate a little bit more? External partnerships, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, gosh, I mean, we could have a whole session on, on that only. Um, yes, so, Partnerships are really at the heart of our unit. Um, I would say ninety percent of the projects we've done, you know, we're in partnership with with, with someone externally. Um, we always look for, you know, that sweet spot between what is relevant for policy and what the goals of the individual are. Um, and, and, and these vary a lot. So we've, we've, we work a lot with academics, as I said. Um, most of our partnerships are with, with, with researchers and with them, you know, what, what we do is, you know, to, to really understand and to really make sure that uh, they get um, an environment wherein they can test their theories. Um, but in doing so also, you know, bringing some innovation and some insights. Um, and so maybe, you know, if, if we were to implement, you know, if, let, let's take a very practical example. You know, if we were to implement an RCT, um, and you know, a researcher has a specific idea, uh, well, okay, then let's make, uh, you know, the control group not not only you know the business as usual, which we usually keep to, but also you know, uh, what what is the the current uh, state of the art behavioral science with you know in the specific policy area. And, um, and this usually allows us to um, significantly improve policy outcomes. Um, of course, you know, this, it's, it's not always optimal, um, especially, you know, at, at the early stages uh, when you really want some quick wins. Um, and I guess that the easiest thing to do then is to actually um, copycat, you know, just go and read one of the behavioral insights team reports, ideas 42, you know, and just do something that, you know, they've done and they've done number of, the number of times and there is evidence that, uh, you know, certain techniques, you know, can be easily replicated, do those. Um, researchers aren't necessarily interested in those. Now, what, what we found, however, is that the I focus mostly on researchers and in, in my presentation, so I thought we would run out of time, uh, but actually we have a number of um, members in our community that don't come from, uh, from research. And, you know, we have people that work in the private sector. We have people that work in other government agencies and, and their motives, their goals are different. Uh, so we actually have, um, a very, you have a wonderful small community of Italian behavioral practitioners around the world. And we, um, and you know, a lot of them uh, have helped us not because, you know, they want to get necessarily anything out of this, but you know, they're just so happy that the field is finally progressing in, in Italy, right? I mean, Italy, it's, it was just ridiculous, right? I mean, Italy is a G7 country and it, had no behavior insights unit, you know, until recently. Uh, so many Italians abroad uh, have been excited, you know, and wanted to collaborate. Um, others, you know, do, do it because of um, 
uh, you know, they have a vocation, you know, for for service. So they, they generally want to help, you know, the cause. And, and so they want, you know, they see it as sort of a, a volunteering activity. Others do it, you know, for experience. Um, uh, maybe, you know, some more junior people, you know, they want to uh, move, step away from the lab and do things in the field. Um, they do it for the experience, you know, to, uh, to, to gain experience on their CV or practical experience. So everyone um, basically has, you know, their, their different goals. And it's not easy to actually uh, always find, you know, the, the, the match. Um, but over time, I think that uh, if you do have a model uh, that allows, you know, to, to be nimble, you know, in setting up these collaborations, it can be an extremely valuable resource. I mean, we, we, I mean the, the stuff we did during COVID, you know, it was amazing. And it was only thanks to, you know, people are around the globe, right? We, we didn't do much, honestly. I mean, we were just mostly coordinating, but we had, you know, 30 people around the world, you know, working around the clock. Um, you know, when, when somebody, you know, was going to sleep, there would be someone else in Australia, you know, taking up the task and, and finishing it. Um, so it's, 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 I think, you know, it can be extremely beneficial to, uh, to have these collaborations uh, set up in, in such a, an agile uh, way. Great, great. And I think Jackie is going to lead with a few questions we got from the audience. Go ahead, Jackie. Yes. So to start, we have one question about a point you made at the end of your presentation, specifically on incorporating the people that you are uh, ultimately impacting in your interventions into the process of designing or perhaps soliciting feedback on those interventions. So could you speak more about that and perhaps how that may be influencing your outcomes in the end as well? Yeah. Sure. So when it's not always possible, of course, and oftentimes, you know, we're cons we have time constraints and, you know, we just have to basically design an RCT within a couple of days and, and in those instances, it's fine. But whenever possible, we actually try to bring in all the stakeholders. Um, we try to bring in uh, fellow civil servants that don't necessarily have any uh, knowledge on behavioral science, but nonetheless have specific um, sectoral knowledge, um, as well as, you know, people from uh, outside the, the municipality, so any stakeholders. Um, this is, you know, something that actually I've, you know, we've worked very well with ethnographers when, in, in this sort of setup, because they, they really understand, you know, the qualitative aspect of it. And another piece of advice that I would give is, you know, when, when, when a unit is expanding and you're hiring, uh, you know, to look for someone, of course, that has quantitative skills, uh, but also, you know, qualitative skills. Um, now, the, the, this, this, of course, you know, it, it it's hard for me, you know, to give you a rule of thumb because um, each project is different, and each and the policy errors. I mean, you know, go from uh, from schooling to littering. So you know, it's they're completely different. Um, and but um, I guess my main takeaway is to you know always um, give it you know whatever the idea you know of the non-behavioral guys are uh, you know give it a shot and this is beneficial i think for two reasons one is because you never know right let the data tell you let the let an rct tell you what actually works um and then the second way is because actually you know by by letting people you know getting their hands dirty in 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 co-designing interventions um you're securing long-term collaboration which again, I think is really the, the key issue, right? Of behavioral insights unit. It's to actually have internal buy-in. And um, it's, it's that, that, that's the hard part, right? I mean, having the buy-in from the top uh, hardly ensures uh, productivity 
in terms of you know actually running operations um and actually you know i think that sometimes so what we did is set up the unit directly under the mayor's cabinet um office or within the mayor's cabinet office under under the mayor and that was certainly good for some things because that you know gave us the opportunity to work to work across the policy spectrum from um, waste management to public transit to uh, COVID. But it made operational things much, much more difficult because usually the higher you're in organization, you know, the, the, the more bureaucracy it is, right? Because more things are at stake. So, you know, even when you have something very silly, you need to go through uh, 10 different people uh, b before you can actually proceed. And um, another issue, you know, is really um, th the higher you go, the busier people are. So my position has always been within the mayor cabinet office, but I actually, you know, didn't, you know, had two lovely meetings at the beginning with the mayor um, before, you know, when, when, when I was sort of, you know, pitching the idea to her. But what, um, once I had actually signed the contract, you know, I didn't actually meet the mayor for three months. Uh, so it was literally, you know, just me going and knocking on doors. Um, and whereas, you know, if, I think if you maybe start, you know, within a specific department that maybe has a more um, focal area, uh, a, a policy area, uh, then, you know, you might be able to actually um, collaborate with all the um, members of that host uh, host um, set host department host division and uh, and leverage that um, so I guess you know it's good to be at the top once you have very strong buy-in once you have resources uh, I know the BAT you know they started 10 Downing Street uh, but you know they had 10 people um, they had budget um, if, if you don't have that, it, it may, as counterintuitive as it may sound, but it might actually, you might be better off actually doing something, you know, with, with, uh, within a smaller division of, a, of an organization. Yeah, great. And speaking of getting that buy-in, you, you showed some out-of-the-box interventions, one that didn't follow the typical bureaucracy. How did you go about overcoming the resistance uh, so that you were actually able to do some of those early trials. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess I should give you the diplomatic answer, right? Because, um, I mean, the, the reality is that sometimes it gets really awful. Um, for, you know, for those in the audience who come from Italy, uh, the, the municipality of Rome, you know, is, is a really difficult environment. It's you know, was plagued, you know, by corruption for decades. Um, the, uh, I think 30 or 40% of the government executive, and these are the career civil servants, uh, have, um, have been in, at some point of their lives or currently are indicted. Um, you can't really do anything, you know, you can't really fire them. Um, and that, that's, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the reality you know, of, of this context. So sometimes, you know, I, I, sometimes I felt that whenever people didn't want to do things, it's because they were, that there are, you know, indiv I'm talking about individuals and not, nothing systematic, but there are people who actually are happy with, are happier with, you know, the way things are now. Um, and they don't want them to, to change for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's, it's, it's really tough sometimes. And, uh, and sometimes, you, you know, you have to be sort of aggressive and call them out and escalate. Um, you know, one a very silly intervention we did on tax compliance, you know, and just consider, you know, adding a sheet in a in, in a tax reminder that was already being sent at zero cost. Uh, that had to be seen by 
the city minister of budget, the mayor, and so on. And trust me, there was nothing scandalous. Uh, it was much less scandalous actually than um, the one I showed, you know, with, with the picture of the child. Um, and that, that happens often. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, but my strategy was just, you know, to be persistent. And um, just, you know, people here try to, to stop you, you know, by exhausting you and you just have to exhaust them back. Uh, sometimes just, that's just the way it is. Now, again, you know, this is a particularly, um, how to say, harsh context. Um, so I hope that, you know, in most organization, you don't have to go, you know, and use such drastic uh, measures. So um, my, my guess is that um, in more sort of rational organizations, then the, the, the key would be to actually get people buy in through um, not, not very unconventional um, strategies, uh, at least at the beginning. I mean, do you use something that is going to, you know, to somehow uh, astonish people, to somehow surprise them, but something that has a very little chance of, you know, backfire, basically. Um, and then, you know, progressively get, get their, get their buy-in. Um, yeah, I think that's, 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 you know, the more sort of realistic answer in any context outside of the municipality of Rome, I hope. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And you had mentioned at the beginning that you ran, uh, if I heard correctly, 40 projects in a year and a half. Uh, at least speaking from personal experience, one project can last a year and a half. What was that process like? How, how were you able to manage all 40? Uh, and I guess from a leadership perspective, where did you sit in relation to all of those projects? Yeah, so an important element, I guess, is that during the first year, you know, forget about sleeping. I know that's not sustainable <laughs> and I know there is plenty of evidence advising against that. And I, of course, you know, I agree with the evidence, uh, but I think that um, if you don't propel the initiative at the beginning and you don't have some tangible and numerous results early on, I think that, you know, that you're just going to run out of thrust and, um, and it, it gets very dangerous. So the, most of the food interventions were, had some, some experimental or quasi-experimental setup. And um, some, you know, were sort of, you know, inter new intervention from, you know, from scratch, like the the VR one, right? That's uh, that's that's just an intervention, you know, that we designed, you know, from um, from from very early on, you know, and the, you know the whole implementation and stuff. Other other things were just, um, and that's not that's sort of you know more structural intervention. Um, other interventions were. Uh, actually just adaptations of already existing processes. And uh, in a, the municipality of Rome, nobody had ever thought about having a control group. Nobody had ever thought about randomizing things. Uh, nobody had ever thought about testing things. Um, so sometimes, you know, we, for instance, we, the, there was an initiative on democratic participation to in, in a specific context. And people were being sent uh, an email campaign and all of the 500,000 people in our newsletter were receiving the same email. And so we said, well, why don't we, you know, test some different variations, right? And, and just by changing, you know, the, the framing of the email, and, um, we were able to actually increase by 250% 
uh, the number of people using you know, some some analytics also later on, but but most you know it was just you know changing, uh, you know message framing and salience and using more persuasive language, um, and, and, and this was enough to have a, a huge impact on this initiative actually. Um, so it sometimes uh, you know you can't randomize and our and my policy has been, you know, to always say yes when, when people from other departments ask you for help, uh, because at the beginning, you know, at least in Rome, it didn't happen very often. It does now, um, and we, we actually can't keep up with uh, with requests. But earlier on, you know, we um, we didn't get uh, many requests for collaboration from other divisions. And so, you know, whenever anything was coming up, we would say yes. And sometimes, you know, it would simply uh, consist in, I don't know, uh, how can we, you know, change, uh, uh, you know, this, this very particular and small aspect of a process and, you know, what's, what's the, the policy result? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, we would still try to say yes, just, you know, to make, you know, to keep the, to keep the spirit going. And, Another way that we structured the, the, the collaboration is that the, the single divisions that collaborate with us on the Behavior Insights project, they have to be part of the, of the, of the group that um, um, talks to basically the, the research partners. So of course, you know, we are always there, but at the end of the day, it's going to be I don't know, the postdoctoral researcher at uh, Boston University, you know, talking to the uh, public transportation company. And, uh, you know, we are there to facilitate, but they also have to start interacting. And that way, you know, uh, we can take up more initiatives than we would if we were just, you know, uh, micromanaging all of them. Super interesting model, uh, quite unique. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, there's one specifically on the studies you spoke about with eye tracking and EEG, so more uh, methods that probably aren't used as often for internal government units. So in, in your opinion, what was the value add to using these types of methods and were you able to actually influence any policy change with that data? Okay, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So. As I said, my main goal was not necessarily to have a short-term impact, you know, with, with each specific method. Uh, my goal is really just to show my colleagues here, you know, what how these methods can be used and that these methods exist, right? Frankly, you know, um, even many behavioral practitioners, they don't use uh, technologies, right? Very, very few use biomarkers, you know, genetics uh, is almost unheard of within our um within this practice um so again the main goal was not you know to to, to produce policy it, it turned out actually that that we did and specifically you know with eye tracking we evaluated the fair evasion campaign and what actually uh happened in the end is that the campaign was halted because of the you know the the evidence that emerged from from the studies uh so it did have actually an immense um implication uh, policy-wise. Uh, but again, even if that hadn't been the case, you know, I wouldn't have been uh, too worried about that um, because I, what, what I've seen is, you know, that actually the, you know, different departments that have worked on this have actually learned a ton. I have worked a ton, you know, th throughout, you know, in each project, uh, I learn a ton and, and people learn a ton. And I think that's the main, uh, that, that should be, that's just as important as each uh, specific policy outcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Federico. And I just wanted to thank you, Jackie, and everyone who has joined us today. We are going to wrap up. This was our last session uh, for the uh, Big Mentoring Program and uh, Public Good, Hero Science and Public Good. Uh, so we are looking forward to seeing you again in the spring. Until then, have a wonderful holiday season. 
And um, again, thank you, Federico, and thank you, Jackie. Have a good day, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.